All right, folks, uh, Net 110. Sorry, I'm a little bit behind schedule already, and we're only in the second week of the semester. Um, I do owe you folks some assignments and practical labs that you can work on. Um, so I am working on that. Um, first time teaching this course through Cengage. I use MindTap and other courses, but those courses have been set up for me previously. So I still have some, uh, some uh, wrinkles to iron out here. <clears throat> Excuse me. That said, let me try to bang out some more of these slides. So at the end of week one, we finished um, deck one. So this, we'll start deck two here. Um, there are 12 total chapters in this book. Um, so we'll, we'll try to keep uh, week two will be in module two, week three will be in module three, et cetera. And then we'll, we'll, we'll break out some time for maybe a midterm and a final exam. But let's see um, how this plays out. All right, so 48 slides in this deck, including the title slide, the summary slide, uh, and these objectives. Um, okay, I'm going to focus on everything listed in this slide. I'm going to seemingly focus a little harder on uh, maintaining network documentation. Um, I don't have enough fingers to count the number of crappy environments I've worked in, made worse by the fact that nothing is documented. Early in my career, we would use spreadsheets. You know, we would uh, manage this kind of stuff manually. Um, as networking has progressed, as I've matured in my career, uh, we'll use either paid or free tools in those environments that won't spring to, uh, to pay for tools. Visio is a tool I use to uh, create network diagrams, but you can use uh, programs like um, Angry IP Scanner, Advanced IP Scanner, uh, the Angry Port Scanner, uh, another tool called N as in November, map, uh, N map, all one word. Um, that will do a, an IP and port scan of various environments. And <clears throat> those are the free tools I've used. There are other tools that you can pay for that will go out, grab that information, and, and put it into a, a manageable uh, map for you. Okay. And then, of course, we have to talk about change management uh, and, and what Microsoft uh, and Cisco consider to be recommended practices. All right, so we'll talk about cable. Um, crossover cables, um, straight patch cables, um, and rollover cables uh, for those uh, old uh, Cisco devices that don't use USB-type uh, cables. Um, there are any number of categories, short uh, CAT for short CAT, followed by a number. Uh, and I've been working with CAT cable since CAT version 3. Now you can buy cables, and I didn't realize this until just recently. I didn't realize the CAT 8 standard had been published and is in use. Now, we'll get more into the heart of the matter as we go, but pretty briefly stated, the higher the number, the longer the distance of the run you're allowed, and the greater the throughput over that distance. So I have some reading to do on CAT7 and CAT8 cable. Um, for the longest time, uh, Ethernet cable, unshielded twisted pair, or UTP, that th these are supposed to be zeros, had a maximum length of 100 meters. You could run cables longer than that, but you would run into this problem called attenuation, or signal degradation. The Ethernet signals get weaker over distance unless there's some piece of hardware in the middle to refresh that signal strength, right? It could be an intermediate switch in the middle, uh, something called a repeater, uh, and things like that. But anyway, so we've got this UTP, unshielded, twisted pair, and we've got this other type of cable called STP, right? Stone Temple Pilots. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, shielded twisted pair. Um, one of the things you'll learn when running network cables, uh, fluorescent lights, electromagnets, um, heavy machinery that has motors, 
uh, things that cause EMI, electromagnetic interference, can really bugger with signals across unshielded cabling. Shielded cabling is thicker. It's harder to work with around tight spaces and corners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because it's shielded and thicker than unshielded pair, but it is less prone to EMI errors. EMI errors are notoriously tough to diagnose. Right? Normally what happens is you inherit a network that someone else has built. You may or may not have a map of where your cables are run, right? where your MDFs and IDFs are, your main distribution and intermediate distribution facilities. <clears throat> you might not know the lengths of some of those runs. Okay, we use this term called home run. So from wherever the end point is going to be located all the way back to the switch closet, you have a cable run. Sometimes it's plugged directly into a network switch, not making use of a patch panel. And we'll talk about those kinds of things here later. Um, you need special equipment to measure the signal strength. Right? The, the devices I'm most familiar with, they're made by a Fluke. F -L -E oh, God, I'm going to try to spell this all the way out, am I? Fluke. Where you can have a device that measures the length of the cable, the strength of the signal at both ends, whether or not your cable is terminated properly. We'll talk about the different styles of terminations here in a minute. Um, but back to my original point, you may not have a map that includes the distance of various runs. You might have runs of cable that are home run from the end point location all the way back to your MDF, your main distribution facility. The cables may be too long. They may run atop of lots of fluorescent lights next to an elevator where the motor is. Anything that creates EMI is going to bugger up these signals. Okay, So these kinds of things, they're notoriously difficult to troubleshoot. Okay? Unless you happen to be listening, testing your cable signal strength at the time that these issues are happening. Okay? So <clears throat> this style, this ANSI TIA 568 standard, <clears throat> the B standard is the one that I use most frequently. The A standard is allowed, and some, I, I want to say older admins, although I qualify as an older admin, they swear by the A standard. The B standard is what I use. If you haven't seen a pair or, or a, an Ethernet cable before, especially one that is unterminated, okay, what you'll see are eight mini wires that come uh, out of this, this uh, insulation. And the wires are colored, right? Brown, brown, white, green, green, white, blue, and blue, white, orange, and orange, white. Right? That's how you read them. When you're terminating, terminating your cables, the order in which you terminate them is vitally important. Now, you can throw both of these standards out the window, and you can terminate them in any order you want, just so long as both ends follow the same pattern. The problem with that, though, is these things are standard for a reason. If I choose to, ah, these idiots, they don't know what they're talking about, I'm going to make the 568 Mike Kelly standard, and I'm just going to write, I'm going to, this one goes first, and this one goes second. Try troubleshooting that six months from now, or a year from now, right? When you're trying to figure out why can't this end point device connect to the network. I just added some unnecessary complexity, right? Follow the standards. Pick one, either one. I don't care. And follow it for straight through patch cables. Okay? Straight through and patch. I'll use those terms interchangeably. Sometimes I'll just say straight Ethernet as opposed to crossover Ethernet. We'll talk about crossover cables later. <clears throat> of these... Eight wires, four pairs, right? Brown and brown, white, 
um, comprise a pair. Green and green-white compi- comprise another pair. Blue and blue-white, orange and orange-white. Okay, Four pair twisted pair cables. We'll talk about the twisting here shortly, too. Follow the same standard at both ends for a straight through Ethernet patch cord. Of these four pairs, you'll use two wires to receive and two wires to transmit. Well, why do I need eight wires if I'm only using four? Hey, higher standard cables can make use of all eight pairs. Hey, depending on the cable, let's see, provider you use to build your cables, assuming you're not buying them right off of Amazon, um, you might use all eight, right? You might split these off for phones. Now, I'm not saying that's a good idea, right? In fact, that's a terrible idea, but hey, some folks have done that. Why run two cables when I can only run one and use all eight wires, all four pairs, hey? But a straight through cable, this is the standard I use, hey? Now, if you've never terminated your own patch cord, that is an exercise in patience or frustration, really depending on, you know, your tolerance level for um, trying to fit these tiny wires inside this tiny RJ45 end, and then getting a terminator on the end, making sure all eight wires are properly seated, then using that crimper to tighten like a, a, a vice grip, this piece right here, which will lock all eight wires in place. If you're going to build your own cables, it doesn't have to be Fluke. Fluke is like the Cadillac of network testing hardware, but buy yourself a cable tester. It usually is two pieces. You'll plug this end into one piece. You'll plug this end in, into the other piece. You'll, one end will be powered, the other end won't generally. The powered end will send a signal down all eight cables, which should be received by this end and then returned to this end. Assuming all eight cables are terminated properly, you'll have eight LED lights across this faceplate and they should all light up. If one of the lights is not lit, that means you've got an improper termination on one or more of these cables. Cut the wire, re-terminate. Okay. Some companies I've worked for, why would I buy? Ethernet cables are so much more expensive. I'll just I'll buy a spool and then you just cut off what you need. Okay, sure. Okay. If you told me to do that today at age 55, I would garrot you uh, with Ethernet cable. Okay. No, I'm not. Right. Good God, man. I've got arthritis already, and you're going to ask me no. All right. I'm going to buy ANSI compliant pre tested cables. There are a number of uh, certified vendors, Amazon, uh, wherever you shop. You can buy them in various lengths from one foot in length up to 100 feet. The only thing I like about buying a spool of unterminated cable and then terminating it myself is if I need a 200-foot cable or if I need a cable that's two and a half feet long and my choices online are one and three feet. Sure, you could argue that, well, why not just buy the three-footer? And Because if I have a port density of, say, 96 Ethernet cables, and each of them has six inches of extra cable, it looks like garbage. Now, some admins I work with, they couldn't care less, could not care less. Uh, I happen to take a whole boatload of pride in the way that my data closets look. So if you do an image search, Okay. These are all Ethernet cables. Okay. Here's an example of one that is properly terminated, although the fact that the, the, the person who did this used uh, cable ties instead of Velcro 
Okay, I will beat, I will physically assault somebody at my workplace who does this. What if I need to change a module here? What if this module doesn't have an Ethernet cable attached to it, and now we hire somebody for this office, and I need to, well, Christ, I've got to run one cable and then an additional cable tie? No. Okay, use uh, wire cutters to clip all these away and use Velcro. Trust me, the rare times that you have to add, subtract, this module went bad, let's pull it out and replace it with a new one, you're going to thank me. Yes, Velcro straps are slightly more expensive than plastic cable ties, but I hate these things with the, the burning fire of a thousand suns. Okay, anyway, hey, I have worked in so many places where their data closets look like this. Every one of these things is an Ethernet cable. Senior vice president of accounting calls. I can't get on the network. That, that person, that senior VP of accounting, they're not calling the help desk to open a ticket. They're calling the director of IT, right, because their air quotes far too important to open help desk tickets. Okay. It has been my experience that the director of IT will stop whatever he or she is doing and come running down the hallway screaming like their hair is on fire, help me, help me, the sky is falling. I call that the chicken little syndrome. If you've never read the story of chicken little, okay, it, it applies here. So you do your level one troubleshooting. Okay, the network interface card is good. The, you, you test the patch cord to the wall. It's good. You determine that the error is either the, the, the cable here in the, the MDF or the switch port or patch panel that that senior VP has plugged into. Hurry up and find it and fix it. All while your director of IT is calling you every 15 minutes for a status update. Well, what's taken so long? Why haven't you found it yet? If you inherit a network that looks like this, that tough. Okay, we've all inherited networks that look like this. Suck it up, Buttercup. Okay, where you can start to develop a plan to color code cables. Yellow is data. Red might be phones. Black might be IP security cameras. Document that because I guarantee you that the jackass who designed this network doesn't have any documentation. In the early 2000s, I worked at a place that started out looking like this, and it took me three years, a literal three years, to clean it. Okay. But every one of these is an Ethernet cable. Back to my original point. Sorry, I didn't mean to. This sets off my, my, um, ugh, this sets off my OCD when I see closets that look like this, when they should look like that. Okay. This woman, apparently she's going on vacation, and she's praying to the IT gods, please, for the love of Pete, don't let my spaghetti maze of cables, uh, you know, get something buggered. This guy, right, talk about facepalm, okay? Anyway, so my apologies for going on that long diatribe. Um, it's been... 18 years since I worked in that environment. I left in 2005, and I still have not let that go. Okay, Buy your cables if it's cost-effective. Your boss will argue, buying cables that are pre-terminated is more expensive. Well, yes, it is. How long does it take you to terminate an unterminated cable? You have to add your salary to the cost of the cable, the RJ45 ends, the crimper you have to buy. You also have to take into account the time you spend doing this means less time for you to do the other things you should be working on. And I've had a hard time convincing some of my bosses. All of those things cost money too, you know. Okay. Anyway, here is a crossover cable. Now, one end of the cable gets terminated using the A or B standard. The other end of the cable 
the transmit and receive wires are reversed. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So notice, right, that the brown wire goes from connection 8 to 5. Brown white goes from 7 to 4. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. What I use a straight through cable for, I need to connect my PC, my printer, my switch to some device on the network. So let's use a simple example of my desktop computer. Excuse me, I plug that into a wall jack. That wall jack has a cable that runs up behind the wall, plugs into a network switch somewhere. That cable from beginning to end is straight through, Ethernet patch cord. Transmit to transmit, receive to receive. <coughs> Excuse me. Crossover cables are when you're trying to connect like items together. If I have to connect a switch to a router, for example, they're both considered network gear. Generally speaking, a crossover cable is called for. However, more modern devices have these ports called auto sensing. I'm not going to write that out. It, right, it's called auto hyphen sensing. Excuse me one second. Oh, sorry about that. Auto sensing means I can take a straight Ethernet patch cord and plug it in where a crossover cable is called for. Okay? And the devices will automatically detect the signal strength, the transmit and receive pairs, okay? and things will work as normal. Now, on your Network Plus test, you might be asked for the order of terminations. Okay, so I would at at some point. Okay. Now here's how I did it, right? So brown and blue, you can use B or just BR. And then you have brown white. And so I would make a list from eight to one. Okay. So it would be brown and some people write it just B, other people do brown, brown, white. And then I would have orange, I, and I would memorize that list, right? So for blue, of course, it's going to be BL. Okay. So yes, although I'm not a fan of static memorization and regurgitation, I've been in IT, this is my 31st year. The rare occasions I'm asked to make a cable, I look up this standard 100% of the time. But on the test you're about to pay $400 for, you might be asked, you might get credit or lose credit for not having this order memorized. Same thing here. Okay. The top end is B. The bottom end, transmit and receive pairs are reversed. Okay, so I'm technically asking you to memorize three things. This cable order this cable order, and this cable order. Okay, This cable order is the B standard. You already had that memorized from the previous slide. Okay, So your demarcation, so your closet, your main data facility, your intermediate data facilities, right? MDF, IDF, your server room, your data closets, some people call them. Okay? So, using the rules of structured cabling, depending on your ISP, your internet service provider, you might have coaxial cable coming into the building, might be fiber optic cable. This cable from your ISP will connect to a layer two router. That router acts as your gateway, separating your network, which is comprised of these three buildings, from the internet, which I'm not going to try to draw the cloud, because if you remember the last time I tried to draw a cloud, it looked terrible. The internet. Your layer two router acts as the front door that separates your house from your neighborhood, okay, so to speak. Your MDF, in which should be your bigger, stronger, faster data 
network items, your bigger switches, your bigger routers, etc. They might connect, and think of l cs Schnecksville campus. How many buildings are on that campus? One of those buildings holds the main data facility. There are fiber optic runs in conduit underground between the building that has the main data facility and the other buildings on campus. <clears throat> the layer three switch that exists in each of these IDFs through, well, let's see, the last time I looked at it, it was fiber optic cabling. There's a GBIC, G-B-I-C, a gigabit, in, a gigabit interface connector, I think it stands for, G-B-I-C. A fiber optic cable plugs in here. It runs through the conduit. Your switches over here have a GBIC as well. The other end of the fiber connects here. And that's how communications from building C get to building A, get to my router, and then get to the internet. Inside these rectangles, these black lines are indicative of Ethernet cables. Right now, this is indicative of conduit, and that conduit can have Ethernet or fiber optic. Uh, rarer occasions, it can have coaxial cable as well. Um, generally speaking, that's not, uh, unless your network was built in the 1990s, you're probably not using that. <clears throat> so I've got a router connected to my fiber optic input from the internet. I've got straight through ethernet cables or fiber optic cables or depending on the makes and model of my layer three switches in the MDF and IDF, I might have crossover cables here that interconnect my closets with my server room. I've got other layer three switches in this closet. Okay. This switch connects to these computers in this lab in the TC building. Okay. Or maybe the bookstore building, right? That kind of stuff. Okay. So we have here a three tier model. Now only two of the tiers are displayed here. So in our server room, our main data facility, we've got our core components. Our biggest, strongest, fastest network hardware. <clears throat> Here in the intermediate closets, we have the access tier. Hey, I'm sorry, the intermediate tier, which we have not quite as big, strong, and fast. And potentially each lab at l -Tri c for example, will have its own switch. Okay, this is called the access tier. So TC-208 has its own switch. TC-206 has its own switch, right? And these switches, they're generally smaller and slower, but these two will uplink to the medium-sized switch here, which uplinks to the biggest, strongest, fastest switch here. Okay, so that's your three-tier model, okay? But throughout this, we've got coax or fiber here and straight through Ethernet or crossover cables here and straight through Ethernet here. Okay, so that's just a, a, a text-based description of that previous slide. So... Your data rooms, uh, I'm going to call them closets because a lot of places I've worked, we use legit closets. Okay? One of the, the places uh, I laughed, there's a school district that's local to me, and their one data closet for a whole floor of their high school is located in a closet in the wrestling room. Now, those of you who wrestled in high school or have been in the wrestling room, you know, right, generally it's in the bowels of the building. There's no ventilation. There's barely any light. It's usually hot as Hades and humid as heck. And so there was a closet at this one high school where all the gear for this particular floor was located. So 
because there was a door, a solid wood door, by the way, that separated that from the rest of the building, the IT guy asked for permission to get ventilation. Was denied, right? Because if you've ever worked for a school district, you know that budgets are always tight. <laughs> anyway, so this guy, ingenuity, right, is the mother of invention, or necessity is the mother of invention. He went to Walmart or something. He bought himself a Dremel tool. And he cut a hole in the bottom of the door that was wide enough to accommodate a Walmart box fan. Just a little fan that you would put in your window. And he put the fan in, plugged it into an extension cord in the data closet, and was using it to push the hot air out of the closet into the wrestling room, which made the wrestling room even more uncomfortable, right? Yeah. But what are you going to do? You can kick and scream and moan all you want. But in this particular case, that's where the gear is located. And if you can't get permission to do it properly, you have to do what you have to do to at least minimize the negative impact. Those of you who have worked with electronics before, you know that heat and humidity are two of the worst things, right? Static electricity is also bad, right? But electronic gear that generates heat, unless that heat can be dissipated, it builds up inside the, the, the network gear, and it causes short circuits. So anyway, wherever your data closet is, and let's hope it's not next to an elevator. Or if it is next to an elevator, that you're using shielded cabling. I can't promise you that's always been the case. Especially if you have an electrician run your Ethernet cables. Anyway. From the first floor to the second floor. You can run cables vertically. Up an elevator shaft. You know, through the drywall. Okay, whatever the case, you know up through the drop ceiling, drill a hole in the floor, you know, however you have to get an interconnection from this rack of network gear to this rack of network gear. Okay. Once you run your vertical cabling, now you can cable out, right? So you're cabling up and now you're cabling out, horizontal cabling. Oftentimes that cable comes out of here up into the, the dry or the drop ceiling rather, and then down the wall, Maybe you're using conduit. Maybe you're not. Maybe the cables run inside the drywall. If this is a cinder block type wall, the cable might be run outside. I've seen people who have stapled Ethernet cables to drywall. Yeah, that's a great idea for it. I'm just kidding. That's a terrible idea. I've seen people run Ethernet cabling on the outside of cinder block walls, and because they don't they're, they don't have the budget to buy the proper plastic conduit that has double-sided tape that sticks to the wall. They'll just use whatever kind of tape they have available. Duct tape I've seen. I've seen packing tape, although packing tape on cinder blocks usually doesn't last very long. Okay, I've seen all manner of goofy stuff. Anyway, cabling up, cabling out. Okay. Here is what a fiber optic cable looks like. Now, we're going to talk about this much later. Fiber optic cabling, this is glass inside this uh, insulation. Yes, you, you, you can curl up or coil up fiber optic cabling. There is a bend radius. Once you surpass the bend radius 100%, you're going to split the glass, which takes down your whole network. If you're not sure what the bend radius of your fiber optic cabling is, talk to the vendor who provides the cable. Okay, so yes, glass or not, awesome. But anyway, my original point. Fiber optic cabling has a dozen-ish different style connectors. S, T, S, C, L, C. We're going to look at all of those because you're going to have to memorize those too. You're going to have to be able to look at the end of a fiber cable on this test. Not my test. Oh, although I might test you on it. Uh, you know, the test you're about to pay 385 bucks for. They may show you, hey, what? identify this cable end. It would suck to fail 
a $400 test because you didn't know, right, what kind of connector this was. So again, we'll get there. There's a long list to go through. The good news is Ethernet cabling has one style of connector. It's called RJ45, Romeo Juliet 4.5. RJ45 connectors, this is the eight wire four pair. There are two cables, the blue one, the white one. Most likely the network engineer who designed this is using the B standard for cabling. Notice there is a coil here as well. I want to say this now so I don't forget. Extra cable that is coiled and, oh, god damn, cable ties. No, Velcro. What if you have to move this router somewhere else? I hope you brought your, your, your wire cutters. I hope that when you cut this plastic cable tie, you don't cut the Ethernet cable. I hope the guy who put this cable tie on didn't tighten it um, horrifically badly because over time that's going to cut the cables inside the insulation. Hey, I don't know why anybody would use, other than they're cheaper, I don't know why you'd use plastic cable ties. Hey, but again, that's just me. Best practice is extra cable. Coil it up. How much extra cable? Yeah, hard to say. What is the maximum possible distance you might be asked to move this box? Might you be asked to move this box 2 feet, 6 feet, 10 feet, whatever? Make sure you have enough cable. If the cable is coming from the ceiling down, have a coil of cable that you can hide under the drop ceiling tile. Yes, this is my artistic rendition of a coiled cable up above the drop ceiling tile. Okay. You do not want these cables to be taut okay, at all. T-A-U-T, I think is the correct spelling. T-A, no, whatever it is. Tight. You don't want them too tight because over time, the cable will pull away from the connector and these connections will become loose and they'll start sporadically failing. Try troubleshooting that. Okay. Yes, cable management. Now, I'm going to task you with something unofficially. I want you, I'm not going to spell the whole word out. I want you to do a Google search on a cable management system called Neat Patch. N E A T, Neat Patch. Horizontal cable management. And you can't really see it here, vertical cable management. Okay. What you want in your patch panels is color-coded cables. Which of these is voice? Which of these is data? Maybe they're all data, which is why they're all blue. I would hope you wouldn't mix voice, data, security cameras, same colors. It makes it harder for you to quickly identify potential issues when you have a, an issue that needs to be solved. Horizontal cable management allows you to hide the excess cable. Vertical cable management, same thing, right? If you pick this piece of vertical cable management up and put it on this side of the rack, you could hide this part of the cables. Again, hiding the cables doesn't make your network perform any faster, but it shows that I can pay attention to the little details. I can label my stuff. I can try to neaten this as best I can. I want to be able to show this off. What if I'm interviewing you for a position to work with me and you come into my data facility, and it looks like that spaghetti maze I showed you on Google image search. Hey, I know for me personally, and, and maybe you're not OCD, like I've been diagnosed OCD, so I'm allowed to say this. Um, I look at sloppy cabling as I can't trust you to do anything right. Color coding, organizing cables, labeling your infrastructure, three of the easiest things you can do. And if I can't trust you to do this easy stuff, 
I'm going to task you with building me a, a, a switch that uh, uh, makes uh, changes to our BGP protocol. Now, if you don't know what that means, that's okay. But the answer is no, right? If I can't trust you with the little things, I'm not going to trust you with the big things. Okay, so more text related to these slides. How long have I been talking? Okay, a little more than 40 minutes. I want to make sure I don't talk too much. Well, too late for that, sorry. Um, so voice over IP equipment, okay, the acronym VOIP. VOIP equipment, telephones, they connect to the same or different network switches, okay? This is a layer three switch. Now, some switches today are layer two and layer three, meaning they're capable of handling routing decisions as well as MAC address switching. You will have some kind of controller somewhere. Cisco's call manager is one if you're using Cisco VoIP. <clears throat> a Avaya IP office, I think, is another one, right? Where you can get in to the PBX and you can program Mike Kelly's extension is 123. John Jones' extension is 234. Alyssa Milano's extension is 345. Okay. And you can make rules about routing. You have to dial a nine to get out. So whenever Mike Kelly picks up his phone here and dials nine, the PBX sends the correct signal to the gateway saying, hey, open up an external phone line to the telco, telephone company, and out my call goes. But phones, like other network nodes, have IP addresses, they have MAC addresses, they require uh, subnet masks, default gateways. There's something a little uh, later on we may talk about. It's called option 66, okay, for VoIP specifically. Now we'll see if the new Network Plus test objectives gets that far into VoIP. Okay. So here's a graphical representation. Your network diagram should look something like this. Now, obviously, it's going to be labeled, right? If this was L-Tri-C, you know, this might be the tech center building. Okay, our MDF is located in Rothrock Library, I, unless they moved it, right? We have an IDF over in the Student Services Building. So I'm going to have labels like this. I might have, right, okay, so, you know, I teach classes in TC-208. So my office is in TC216. So I might have, right, this is Kelly's computer, and it's going to be in room TC216. Now, how the network team at L3C denotes this in their documentation is up to them. They may not use my name because, you know, what if I quit? Right? What's the turnover for employees at L3C? Well, if it's high enough, then your network team spends more time deleting Kelly's name and adding whomever takes my place. Okay, so maybe, right, they'll denote, right, TC216, and maybe this is a data port. Well, maybe it's data port one. I have a phone in my office that I've never used, so I might have a T216 that these are supposed to be quotations indicating T216. And I might have a voice jack in my office, V1. Properly labeled on the wall jack with a, a uh, label maker, properly labeled in my IDF so that when the network engineer is trying to troubleshoot an issue with my phone, she can go into the IDF and say, aha, TC216's voice port is plugged into this switch, that port because it's properly labeled. Okay. So let me show you what a rack system looks like. These are called two-post telco racks. Generally speaking, they're used for telephone company equipment. But some of the cheaper managers I've worked with in the past, oh, we're not going to throw out that, that good rack. We're going to install these servers that weigh 80 pounds each into this two-post rack. Well, I hope that it's bolted to the concrete floor because if not, 
the extra weight sticks out the back and it can cause the whole rack to tip over. Not that I've ever experienced that in my life. I'm just kidding. I've experienced that a couple times in my life. Okay. Bean counters are the bane of my existence. Okay. If I haven't already made that abundantly clear. Look at how neat this cabling is. Horizontal and vertical cable management. Again, right to my point initially, I would, if I'm interviewing you for a position, I would be chomping at the bit to show you this. And out of the corner of my eye, I'm going to be looking at you to see what's your reaction to the neat, labeled, ordered, color-coded way I've set up my network. And if I get a sense that you're not as excited about this as I am, as stupid as that sounds, I have some doubts, right? Because are you the kind of guy, when the senior VP calls, I need blah, blah, a printer in my office, are you going to take a 30-foot Ethernet cable, plug it into here, run it across the floor, and then plug it into her jack up here? If you're that kind of person, we cannot work together. Okay, because if I see this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my, my marbles. Okay, anyway, enough rambling about my OCD here. Um, these are your more common server racks. These server racks, now they're called four posts because they've got generally casters or wheels here, but you can take the wheels out and replace them with feet. And the feet can screw in or out, up or down to level out the rack. Yes, your racks should be level. Not for performance issues, but you want to eliminate any possibility. If this rack falls that way, and it, all your heavy equipment is in this rack, guess what happens to these three? Bang, 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 right? Like a cascade of failure here. Okay. These racks generally are measured in units or U's. The standard server rack is 42U high. Servers and switches and routers and, and etc. all come in various heights. This bit of cable management, this horizontal cable management, is two units high or 2U. This patch panel is 2U high. This item looks to be 4U high. I can't tell if that's a server, but that would be my guess. Okay. So what you want to do when you're designing your rack layout, how many units do you have and how many uh, racks will you need based on how much stuff put to put into them? Okay. We'll come back to that in a little bit, but since I'm here, my preference for networking gear is these four post racks. Yes, they are more expensive, but they have side panels. They have front and back doors. Depending on the gear you purchase, the back of the server should have cable management that you can add to the back of the rack to tidy up your Ethernet and your power cords, okay, that kind of thing. But you can also add cooling, right? There's these little... Uh, cutouts here that you can add fans to, exhaust fans. Okay, and then you could set up what are called hot rows and cold rows in your data center. Here is, I'm assuming this is an air conditioning unit, which is pushing cold air up into these racks. And then you'll install fans at the top of the racks that push air out. Number one, to pull this cold air in. Number two, to take the heat generated by all these things and push it out. Okay. But anyway, 42 units high, and I believe the standard depth is 19 inches wide. Yep. Okay. Standard network gear, switches, routers, servers, should all be a measurement of units tall by 19 inches wide. Okay, so we talked about hot air, cold air. Now, this is a view of these four post racks from the top. All right, so the camera is up here in the fluorescent light looking down. <clears throat> you want your cold air. So here you have these AC vents. Inside these racks, you've got these fans. So the cold air, the vents in the floor, 
right? That air is coming into and then being sucked into the, the, um, the server rack. When you have multiple rows of racks, you want the, the end with the, all the power supplies facing each other. That's where all the heat gets generated. So you want your intakes for your ACs here in the middle, okay, up in the ceiling. Hot air gets exhausted by these fans, gets sucked into these intake, and then cool air is run through your AC and then pushed up through these floor vents. Okay, uh, hot aisle, cold aisle. Okay, so I think the only thing I didn't talk about here was backbone cabling. Backbone cabling is supposed to be thicker, stronger, faster, and it's what connects your network gear to your main data facility. Okay, most places I've worked, we use the same uh, unshielded twisted pair as our backbone cable. Okay, some places use uh, bigger, thicker, faster cabling for that. All right, so just a couple more slides and then we're going to call it. Uh, let's finish this. Um, Cabling 205. Okay. So less than 10 meters, give or take. 100 meters in total is the allowable length of a connection. So we have to take into account how long is my patch cord. There's a jack in the wall, and on the back side of that jack, there's cable that runs inside the wall up through the ceiling or down through the floor into your data closet, and it plugs into one network switch. What's the total length of this connection? Please make sure it's 100 meters or less. Okay. Yes, you can go slightly longer than 100 meters, and you may never know an issue. But those kinds of issues, especially for cable that's slightly too long, tough to, um, tough to troubleshoot. Okay. Here's a cutout of this is supposed to be the wall. So you have this plate that gets screwed into a box in the wall. You've got a patch cable, 5 feet, 10 feet, whatever the distance is. The RJ45 end plugs into the back of your PC, or if you have a laptop's docking station, there's another, excuse me, RJ45 end that plugs in here. Here you have, hopefully, shielded twisted pair cabling, not always, that runs back to the patch panel, in your server room. The patch panel then has another RJ45 that connects to the switch. Can you home run this cable directly to the switch? Yes, that's not considered best practice. Okay, this is slide 20. I'm not going to read these definitions to you, right? You could pause the video here or download the slide deck and look. And this is slide 21. Again, additional um, documentation here, additional terms and definitions. All right, so I'm going to pause here, trying to keep this at an hour or less. Um, I will catch up to you all in the next one.